Well, hi, and welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Welcome wherever you happen to be. I hope you're having a good day and that all is going well. Today, we get to chat with Jurich Karanovich, and Jurich is in actually Belgrade. And I love one of the things that he said to me in his bio. He said, true prosperity lies beyond material wealth. And I'm really anxious to talk about that some. But I really appreciate the opportunity to have someone that gives that kind of thinking to what uh, what they're doing. He's a wealth therapist and business coach. And we're going to learn all about that as well. So, Jurich, I want to welcome you to Unstoppable Mindset. And thank you very much for taking part of your evening and being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for invitation. And thank you for having me. It's really honored to be part of such an excitement project you are dealing with. Well, thank you. And uh, we're, we're glad you're here with us. Let's start, as I always like to do, by kind of going back a little bit. Tell me, if you would, some about the early Jurich, um, you know, growing up and so on. Let's start there. Uh, from the childhood, I was very amazed about human nature and how should I perceive the social awareness of it. And uh, I was always dealing and uh, trying more to understand why someone is doing something, good or bad, and as well to see how I can relate to it. And in early days, uh, I was uh, a lot of um, learning through play and how to get more creative with my friends and and my surroundings. And basically, that was dealt with, I don't know, a high school. And then after a high school, I was totally amazed and to be totally transparent about the material things of the life and started with economy and the behavioral economist. Actually, I became the behavioral economist. It is something which combined the psychology and the economy, which means I'm analyzing the behavior of the consumers and then based on it, I'm creating marketing and sales strategies. And after some time in my corporate career, I became more and more close to the people and please. And I was more and more passionate about uh, the way they're making their decisions and how they're actually trying to bring uh, their life experience to the work and as well to their lives. And this is actually my second life because this is the for me the breakthrough that I really want to more deal with the people than the corporates and processes and everything else. Mm -hmm. And yes. No, go ahead. And for me, uh, it was very, you know, when you everybody is telling you that you need to love what you are working and to have that added value, and then you will have the feeling that you are not actually working, but that you are producing some value which you can share and bring to others and actually the first time i found that feeling is when i started my journey as a psychotherapist and actually learning how to help people and how more to understand the functional part of their lives and now today i'm dealing with um, very by accident actually I was a um, uh, wealth therapist is a very niche of everything uh, because it's niche that is focused on the ultra high net worth people and their specific uh, way of thinking and their specific lives. And uh, it's very niche, not because everyone else think of the, their wealth. It's very specific because they are combining the... Um, uh, time management uh, very well and they have uh, a lot of regre regrets regarding how they, they are pr prioritizing their time. So it's very difficult, different way and difficult way uh, of the therapy because uh, they can argument by success everything they're doing, doing currently, but as well they are not so 
um, happy with their life. So it's very, uh, by, by logic, it's very difficult to understand. And then you need to bring these, um, let's say, feelings and, and a way of thinking that you need to understand why they are living that way. So and basically, th this is the short version. Yeah, I understand. So why is it that you think a lot of the people who are very wealthy and um, who so many people would say, well, they're successful because they're wealthy, but why do you think they're not happy? And do you think that they view themselves as being successful? Um, yes, they are very aware of their success. And actually, they are utilizing the success very successful in their lives. And this is the biggest challenge for them because they can get with some things um, through their influence or through their status. And um, when actually they want to deal as a, some kind of personal development, uh, for, from them, the business part of their lives and the private part of their lives, it's very um, complicated and it's very um, difficult to separate it. So they are actually not uh, perceiving themselves as, a, I don't know, too much successful. They are more perceiving themselves as they can manage time and value time in better way than others. Mm -hmm. And basically, this is the biggest difference. Uh, what is specific for them is that they are doing that in private life as well. So they can prioritize their... Um, uh, uh, responsibilities, let's say, uh, regarding their families, regarding their uh, child, uh, regarding uh, their wives, regarding their friends. So they are prioritizing uh, their free time uh, with everyone. And this is when it comes to the challenge, did I did it well? And sometimes I need to make a decision which is not beneficial for others. So you'd mentioned that a lot of times they they know they're wealthy and so on, but they're not necessarily happy. How do you, how yes. do you how do they deal with that, or how how do you help them deal with that? Uh, the best way of dealing is to understanding uh, what they can control and what they cannot control, mm. and then what they cannot control to leave it as is, and then focus on what they can control. Usually, uh, the things are that they are closely involved in their everyday life with business stuff. And then it's very challenging to organize personal uh, life and not to reflect on their business uh, part of the life. Uh -huh. So, uh, in practice, we are trying now to utilize all the resources they have. And is it delegating? Is it now AI as a technology? Is it uh, finding some other ways? Uh, and trying to combine as much as possible personal time for them so they can control their personal time in a way they can schedule more with their families and they all can uh, focus more on their children or something what they want to do with their time um, and it's very long-term agenda from one part and they are not so patient so we need to create the micro motivations with them which means we need to utilize it's not like days or hours it's basically minutes and it's very special to them that you need to utilize every minute in your day how to focus on what actually you want to do in that particular time. So it's very challenging to understand their way of thinking and what is suitable for them and not as a traditional therapy to have some tools or to have some uh, known structure and then put it on that path. So you need to customize the path and you need to customize the way of doing things with them. And you need to fully understand that uh, they are not living um, challenging life and they're not living, uh, they're having a feeling of abundance all the time, 
but they need abundance of the time for their loving ones. And this is the focus we what we are now creating is that so, feeling of abundance with their lovings. So a lot of the, the happiness issue comes when they're able to recognize, yeah, I'm very good at earning money. I make a lot of money and that's wonderful, but there's more to life than that. And as working with family and spending more time with family and taking control of personal time and recognizing the value that that brings, that's, that's a lot of what will make them better people. I would, would think you're saying. Yes. And additional on top of it, many of the decisions for them are difficult decisions. Uh, let's say that I need to prioritize my work <coughs> Uh, beside of my children, which means I will see less my children and I will be more on the work, which is not so usual and it's not so, um, let's say, in the real world, you will have a lot of judgment to dealing with that. But not everybody understands the amount of responsibility they have towards the world they're living. Let's say some of them are hiring like 20,000 people. So they're responsible for the 20,000 people. And um, it's not easy decision to prioritize 20,000 employees uh, or in one way or to prioritize, I don't know, spending half an hour with my child. How do they deal with that? Uh, badly. <laughs> they're <laughs> yeah. dealing with that badly. Uh, and Actually, they are trying somehow to steal the time. You know, they are pushing to have 25th hour in a day. Yeah. And uh, they are trying um, to combine things and they are trying to be as close as possible to the families physically at least. And then they will pick a time for um, their children or wives or family matters, uh, not just the work-related re stuff. Because their day is planned not like today, usually some of them, they have planned like two years ahead. So so it's not like I can relate my schedule in one or two months. It's just busy. No, it's upfront one or two years. So yes. you need to schedule a lot upfront and to understand that their way of living and responsibilities are long-term, not a short-term one. Can they deal with things like hiring 20,000 people, can they deal with that better if they do a better job of delegating responsibility and find people yes. they can trust to do, to do a lot of it so that they can really devote time to the other things that are going to make them happy as well? Exactly. Trust is a big part of them. Trust is a big part of them, and they need to be... Um, they, it's very difficult to gain the trust from... from that kind of people because they're not used to it. Yeah. Yeah. They're not used to it. Exactly. They're not used to trust. And I like something else that you said, which is all about learning to focus on the things that you can control also, and not worrying about the things that you can't. I know having um, survived the world trade center and afterward um, beginning to talk about it, that was one of the common things that I began to discuss a lot because uh, we are so afraid of so many things, and most of the time we have absolutely no control over them, and we really ought to learn not to worry about those things because we don't have control over them. We're not going to have an effect on them, and and it's time that we learn to let those things go and focus on the things that we can because it will make us a lot happier, and we'll really be able to to deal with the control. Yes, exactly, and what actually I'm dealing with is – Today, the the average point of view is from some sort of perfection. So either it's good or bad. And um, to get to that point that you are aware of what you can or cannot control, and that transition from putting some things that, okay, I'm fine with that, that I cannot control, and putting some things fine, I can control this, it's a long journey, and it's a very difficult one. And there is many uh, authentic challenges uh, reg regarding every individual that I have on my sessions. And um, they need 
a lot of time to find their own authentic path, how to deal with it. So basically, they are having on that path a lot of mistakes as well. And they have a lot of trying's how to do it. And my job actually is to support them that they endure during that process. How do you teach people to be more open to trusting and creating trusting relationships? Um, actually, it's a practical way to teach people for that. So I currently, uh, the best way how to do it is to have this micro 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 motivation, which is some kind of homework, um, and then to start with the things that it's not so dependable or not so um, have high value impact in your life. Uh, let's say in the um, uh, store to gain the recommendation from unknown people or you are asking advice for someone uh, you need uh, online from some expert or something like that. And then you're trying to prove that he's right or actually that his advice or her advice is beneficial for you. And this kind of small step, steps actually are building trust with you and your system to recognize what is trustworthy for you and what is not. So I'm actually pointing out that this um, calibration and this system, is it something trustful or not? It's with you, not with them. Mm -hmm. Basically, because first people want to see and somehow um, are putting the trust with outsiders and not with themselves. And I'm putting that system back on them. The bad thing or the most responsible thing for that is to have the ownership of your mistakes and your decisions. And this is the difficult part. So you can own your mistakes first, then you can gain trust from others, at least in your life. Yeah. I know I talk a lot about working with dogs. I've had eight guide dogs in my life starting back in 1964. So it's a long time ago. But one of the things that I learned, a lot of people talk about dogs saying that dogs love unconditionally. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I think that dogs do. But what dogs don't do is trust unconditionally. Um, but the difference between people and dogs, I believe, is that dogs are, unless something incredibly horrible traumatizes them, dogs tend to be a whole lot more open to trust than people do. People are always going, well, well, what's uh, the agenda? You've got a hidden agenda or whatever, and they are very suspicious. Dogs are more open to trust, and I think there's a lot that we could learn from them about that. Because if they're if they if they convey the message to you, they're open to trust, which they do, and you're wise enough to experience that and see that, then you can establish an incredible bond, um, which is what. I and other blind people do with with guide dogs when we really understand the whole idea of trust. But it yeah. starts with the dogs being open to trust, which is something that's very hard for us to do, especially nowadays where there's so many crazy things happening in the world. And we've got to get over that. Yes, actually, the dogs are a very good <clears throat> example because the dogs are teaching us how to love by actions and not by words, because I have a dog as well. Mm hmm. Uh, second of all, uh, the dogs are teaching us how to cherish the now moment. So not the past, not the future. I will do it later. It doesn't function well with the dogs. Mm -mm. And um, as well, uh, they are teaching us because most of the dogs we will outlive. Um, then uh, it's teaching us how to... Um, cherish the time we have with them and to have these rich experiences during the day with them. So it's it's similar with people. Um, if you have the awareness of your time and that it's not given, it, you need uh, to experience, to, to gain experience through your day as long as possible because through them you will learn a lot. And... Um, this is what people currently is forgiving or forgetting um, that they have a very little amount of time freely. Most of them 
are on the work, then we have eight hours of sleep, then we have some agenda regarding if you have families around the kids, and then you have one or two hours basically for yourself. And we are um, so easily giving away that watching TV or having some passive um, things to do and not actually starting to building that control um, part of our lives, which we can control at least a couple of hours or half uh, an hour at least. Yeah, and I I hear exactly what you're saying. And um, they're, the dogs are great teachers, even though they may or may not think so. Um, and one of the things that I think dogs are great at teaching us if we choose to understand them and observe them and work with them is they're great at teaching us how to build teams. Um, because like with, with me and my guide dogs, the dog has a job to do and I have a job to do. The dog's job is to make sure that I walk safely. And of mm -hmm. course, that means that the dog has to walk safely. But it's yeah. not the dog's job to know where to go and how to get there. And I don't want the dog to know that. It's really important that we each respect each other's job. And dogs exactly. dogs teach us that, which is so wonderful. Yes, yes, <clears throat> yes. Well, I think if we allow... Um, people or animals around us we can learn a lot but yeah. we are too focused on on some what's next and not on now and this is the issue i had the pleasure of interviewing someone fairly recently and we were talking about this whole idea of personal time work time and so on and what she said was that she is very specific and volitional about making sure that she deals with her personal time. She deals with her children and her husband, and she has made that a priority. And I think that's part of the issue is that she has worked so hard at it that it has become a habit to, to do the things that allow her to spend time with children, with husband, um, her personal time, and at the same time, still be able to do the things that she might have to do in so far as work is concerned. But she has yes. made that decision to make that happen. Yes, exactly. Um, we need to be a little brave to make decision because for every decision, there is a price. And um, we just need to um, have the awareness what's the price and what will impact on us and that's it right well um you went to college right yeah yeah All right and when you got out of college what did you do i started um as in financial um department and uh i was a financial controller and that allowed me to learn everything about budgeting, PNL, and financial side of the business. After that, I was a project and a product manager. And for that, that allowed me how to understand the business actually is building uh, the market side of the business and how they're building the products and how they're organizing the processes regarding the products. And after that, I was a change manager, which means I was dealing more on the people side regarding the cultural change and organizational change. And that bring me closer to the people to understand how uh, they are gaining um, or pushing the resilience toward the innovation and some new processes and some change, because the natural way of the people is to afraid to be afraid of the change and to be a little bit uh, more aware what will happen because uh, we are creatures of the routines. And uh, that actually corporate part of my life allowed me to be a business coach because I fully understand the business side and I fully understand what is what, is, what are the needs and components to have a successful business. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I believed as well that uh, 
not so many people or organizations are dealing uh, enough with the people side so i transfer myself and focus more on the people side and then uh, my psychotherapy education was actually enhancing me how to understand their thinking and how to actually create the tools that better help those employees um and after that i was um starting to have these in-house trainings and to deal more with the corporations but i was understanding that it's i'm sharing my knowledge or impacting only them and then after a while then i was starting to deal with uh, ceos and uh, with um, higher management because then through one session you can influence a lot of um under direct people and you can influence the way of thinking on the top and it yeah. was very faster way in the corporate environment to have the influence immediately of some changes well you have um, you have a lot of background in finance and as you say behavioral economics which um, yes it's an interesting blend of skills and knowledge yes yes because i was um always uh, thinking through myself and i know that when i was searching for my therapist uh, I was searching someone who who will understand that I want to work and I like my job. However, I need to a little bit help to balance it, not to be more focused on the job and not to be focused on my personal life and emotional life. However, to be realistic about it, so it not to uh, be uh, in a way that you know it's. You should be working less and more focused on your emotional life because you will be happier. Because in that point of time, I didn't know how and I wasn't aware how exactly it will influence my life. And then because of that fear, I was not fully, um, let's say, um, motivated to, to go that path. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things why I started to go uh in some different direction because i'm starting with the uh, feeling and i'm starting with the understanding that the in the real life we need to work the financial freedom is very um uh, challenging to have uh as well uh we have a lot of um decisions in the past that influence influence that our now uh as well we have currently some decisions we cannot do immediately we need a little bit to build ourselves to change the job to change the environment to to focus more on ourselves we need to create this space for that yeah and um my way of therapy actually is more realistic one i want to say it uh more pro proactive one which means i'm more focusing on functional way of living than how it should be in some perfect environment. Well, you you make it very clear that it is important for us to find ways, no matter who we are, no matter how wealthy we are, we need to find ways to have time for ourselves or for the things that are important to us or should be important to us outside of work. Work is great, but that's not all there is in the world. And um, and I know that there are so many people that think that, uh, well, I'll work and I'll deal with things later on. And it doesn't, it does, that's not the way to do it. It doesn't work that way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But as well, we need to understand them why they're thinking that way, because there is, um, there is reasonable arguments why he's focusing more on the work because he has a uh, loan to pay. He has installments for mm -hmm. the reason. He has the family. He wants to provide the best for his family. So it's not like just to judge them because of their decisions or to say, um, yes, you are currently more focused on your work. You should be more focused on your emotional side or the family side. And then let's do it right away. No, you need to understand what is in real life possible to do it and then create an environment or the frame which he will not lose himself in that transition. It's a balance. 
and it will it exactly. will always be a balance. But, but it's we, unique balance. It's it is a unique, unique balance. balance. Yes, it's a unique balance for everyone. You said something a little while ago. I want to go back to. I love to talk about mm-hmm. it. You said that um, we um, in life um, the the natural thing is to resist change, and yes. we need to learn about that. Is that do you think a natural thing that we're that is hardwired into us, or is that something that we learn because everybody keeps talking about? Um, I hate to change. Is it a learned behavior, or is it really natural to the point of view that what we have to do is to rewire our brains from a natural thing of resisting change? Actually, it's half half because our uh, cells are built that way to preserve energy. And every change, every creating some other narrow parts in our brain actually are using more energy than it should be. And then our body resists it because the uh, the body is built to uh, save the energy. This is the biolog- biological part. And regarding the learning, the change, of course, um, it's not just the learning is our past experience regarding how we communicate with ourselves. So if we was consistent with ourselves in the past experience, it's easier for us to change. If we were not, it's difficult for us because our mind knows that, let's say, if we said, I will now uh, walk a dog and I don't do it, my brain is registering that, that I told to myself that I will do something and I didn't do so these past micro experiences are a little bit blocking us how to do it and and how to change and to be willing to change uh, as fast as we want. Yeah, it is something that we can learn to do. Yes. So, yes. so um, given your expertise in finance and um, the other things that you do, behavioral economics, for example. So how has all of that affected how you work and how does that make you um, function better as a wealth therapist? And I want to really talk about the whole concept of wealth therapy um, and and what is that exactly? Yeah. Um, First thing, how it goes, most of those ultra wealth people are having the many of their stuff and then you cannot immediately talk with them you have a couple of people first to talk with and then they're like filtering are you suitable for them or not Mm -hmm. and basically uh, the first thing is you need to understand their business side you need to understand what they're doing why they're doing that and from let's say from which way their wealth is coming from is it um generational wealth is it something they built the ourselves uh is there something that um it's a family uh, wise so you need first to understand that the second thing you need to understand is their schedule why their schedule is such busy schedule and why they're uh, not having so free time for something they would want to and not to perceive them as a successful people, not perceive them as a people who has wealth, but to perceive and understand why their schedule and why their routines are the way they are. And from that point, you need a little bit more understanding on the business side, on the business processes uh, of the how actually the company is functioning in why they are the crucial part of it. This is the first part. The second part is when you are dealing with them, you are having, let's say, one hour in one month. So you need to utilize that one hour fully. It's not like every week we will have a session and then he will talk. No, you need to be very proactive with them. And to understand uh, this fixation of the now they have, Uh, you need to understand every part surrounding them and their environment. So uh, that's why you need to have this understanding of behavior of the consumers and and the customers. You need to understand the business processes 
you need to to understand the decision of the human making and then you need as well to understand um what they want to accomplish um and they are usually not so patient people so you need uh to have like step by step guidance exactly what you are expecting from them so they can behave and put in their schedule and all of it to combine into one you don't have it to learn just as a psychotherapist and you don't have to learn it just as a behavioral economist you need actually to have the experience in that parts of of the puzzles so you can be most effective you have to relate to them and they have to recognize that you really relate to them yes you need they need to trust you that you exactly know why they are doing something yeah well the um it 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 and does get back to trust in in every sense of the word well so how long have you been out of the corporate world as such and 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 running and operating your own business as a wealth therapist and business coach regarding business coach i'm i having like 11 years of experience and and i'm i'm parallelly combined that with my corporate work regarding therapist i'm not so experienced in it i have 2 years of experience and um i'm trying now uh to comprehend it with additional learnings and uh, additional um uh, knowledge that i can conquer uh through some um let's say supervisions and through some modalities that are more focused on wealth therapist and and that part of, of the world let's say um but however i don't believe that um they don't need just a, another one therapist they are not searching for that they are searching for the person who can um somehow walk along them so they they call it they have a uh saying they want i level partner this is the saying in in their environment and they want someone who will walk alongside them and understand the business side the private side the family side and their personal personal deep personal side yeah. like a character side and for that uh you need a lot of focus and you need a lot of researches because uh it's not common when they ask a question you need to find a solution and not to offer them some generalization or explanation they don't want that they want the solution so you need to customize the solution especially for them and then you need to utilize all the resources you have life one um professional one um emotional one uh, uh learning from other clients uh, learning from uh, my colleagues i'm utilizing it all reading the books whatever i can combine and they actually want that that you um somehow uh build yourself enough that you can influence and they can trust you of your influence to their everyday life it you have a, an interesting road that you have to walk because as a coach typically your job isn't to give them the answers but to guide them to discovering exactly. the answers for themselves exactly but as a therapist you're more involved in in helping them with answers so it it is an interesting challenge to to balance those two exactly so they don't want the therapist to ask them a questions and then they think of it because they don't have a uh, free time in their mind from that they want a quick solutions and yeah. they want how what i can do now to be a little bit better this is it so they don't want some perfect solutions they don't want some um uh yes you can narratives they don't want some emotional support to guide them through the process they want the quick solutions but it doesn't work that way um yes and no uh you can have a quick fixes and you can in short term feel better and you can in short term fix some things but you are not fixing the core right uh issues and you are not fixing the big picture actually uh, however 
uh, you need to be a little bit tricky with them and you need a little bit to have a ability to manipulate them. So you are offering a short term solutions, but actually what you're doing, you're building a big picture. So after a while, they understand why they did it in that way. So you need to be a little bit to outsmart them and, and to be in every corner be, before them so they can be very trustful regarding the final outcome. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting and prob probably a really good way to put it. Well, how about for you? you um, you're, you're doing a lot of, of work. Is there um, a story you can tell us or some pivotal moment that really um, caused you to, to operate the way you do today? I mean, something probably was happened that, that gave you the inspiration to do what you do? Yeah. Actually, in my life, I was first not so satisfied with, with myself. And I tried the first step is uh, to be better uh, through learning. And then I went to NLP. Then I went for the coaching, then for the uh, psychotherapist. And only in the um, second year of my training regarding the psychotherapist with uh, personal development, which is a little bit different from the therapy because you're focusing on the issues more they can re reflect others, then you combine to understand that some part of me cannot be changed and I need to learn how to live with it and some part of me can be changed. And this is actually the first thing um, of me that I understood that I will not be uh, as a perfect imagination that you will be better, better, and better. No, you will be better, better, and better than yourself yesterday, but not in this general public view as it is uh, advertised. This is the first thing. The second thing, I really, I am as a man, very practical. And I really wanted to find for me the therapist who is practical and who can help me with my self and my personal development, how to gain it more um, step by step and not to ask my, uh, myself only the questions and then to wait for the answer. This is the part of it uh, I was very waiting for. And I had a difficulty to find one and I found uh, a, a woman who helped me a lot. And actually what I was striving in that point of time is when you are thinking like small percentage people really change and you're listening that only, I don't know, 1% of the people who are going to therapy really change. And you have the talk like that. And I was some sort of narcissistic way to be that part of the people. However, I learned that I don't need to be that part of, I don't know, 1%. I can be very general just to be aware of what I can do and what I cannot. And what I'm not feeling that it's good for the others to be aware of it and to control it. And basically that point of view, I was very cherished about because I think it's very realistic because now in the days you have... Um, too many judgments, is it narcissistic, is it uh, um, uh, like this, so is it toxic, is it, I don't know what they're using on the social networks now, and it's not so simple that you are good or bad, actually is the space between what you should deal with, and every day is day for, for itself, and you can choose in that day, should you be good or bad for you, how do you feel about it? Because many of the people now understand through many clients are not feeling good because of their bad decisions. They're feeling bad of it, but they did it anyway. So I'm learning them how to be aware that in the next situation that they're feeling eager to do something bad and to have the bad decision, to be aware of it and to stop it. And it's not that he can change or she can change not to have this feeling to go that way or everybody is perfect so actually the therapy is uh, lowering or hiring the probability of doing something good or bad so um i i hear what you're saying and 
um, there, there has to be a lot that went into you getting to the point where you are able to articulate that. Do you do a lot of, and do you encourage people to do introspection that is taking time every day to think about what they did that day and what they could have done better, or even in the successful things, could they have done some of those things better? Do you do you really encourage people to, no matter what is going on, take some time at some point during the day to think about um, what they're doing and why it works or doesn't work? Exactly. So basically the first step, at least the clients who are coming to me, is they are having the feeling that they are not doing enough. So my day is not so, um, um, let's say, interesting. I don't have so, uh, so much enjoyable experiences. I am wake up, going to work, then coming home, then I don't know, watching TV or doing something, going to gym at least. And they have these routines and they are not happy about it. And actually the first thing is to, uh, first step for them is to accept that it's okay not to feel, you know, every day that should be like a Disneyland. This is the first step. The second step is that you understand why it is like that what is the, behind it, and how you can introduce some interesting things and to be more brave about, about searching what, what is interesting for them. And uh, on that journey, they will make a lot of bad decisions. They will make uh, bad plans. But at least in a bad plan, you can focus on the mistakes and not focus on yourself. And basically, this is the shortcut. And then after a while... Uh, three or six months, it depends on the issues. Um, they are then willing to accept, now I'm satisfied how I organize my day, and now I need to enhance myself to have more richer experience in my life. And this is the general path. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. Um, do, you, do you find that people resist introspection especially the more wealthy they are the more money yes. they have and, and all that the harder it is to get them to recognize that there's a need to do that introspection yes because they have a really good arguments that they're right um so basically um i had the client and um he said i'm such a good people and actually he was manipulating people with money because they understand the needs of those people, and then he buy the solution. Is it a new house? Is it helping with their um, healthy needs? Is it helping with their families or something like that? But they are buying the solution through that people. And they didn't recognize that as a manipulation. They recognized that as a good man. And it took a really bold, you need to be a very brave and bold to to um, uh, push and influence that kind of people to understand that that kind of manipulation may be outside is perceived as a good man, but because they are not feeling it, for for them, it's not being a good man. And this is what it counts. Were you, so were you able to... to do, were, oh, go ahead. Yes. Okay. So they need to understand first to listen their <clears throat> inner self, and to understand what for them is a good man and not for others. And because of their status and influences, uh, they are taught from young years how to be good in the public, but not so much taught how to be good with themselves. Were you successful at getting him to recognize that and getting him to yes, step back? And Yes, and, and it was very funny think? story because it took us four months for that. Uh, and after four months, he finally uh, didn't do something and uh, he was feeling awful and he was feeling like, but why I didn't do that? And I said, because you was honest to yourself. And in from that point of time, actually we gained trust. Until now, he was testing me a lot and, mm -hmm. and he was arguing that he, his way of doing things is um, better uh, for himself. But after a while, we 
gain back to helping others, but to be honest about it. So I'm helping others because I can and not because I'm a good man. I'm, and this is totally different things. I'm curious. He, um, You said he was testing you a lot and so on. Why did he even consider working with you as a therapist and as a coach if, if he was um, that way? Because my um, modality of therapy is very direct. And I'm not allowing anyone to um, talk something in which he doesn't believe. And I don't allow um, cl my clients on session to talk something which I don't see relevant for the issue they come came from. So I'm really narrowing the frame and putting them in the corner, as they said. Uh, so they cannot get out with uh, arguments and as much intellectual people it is, he can combine why he's doing this uh, as the way he's doing. So this is what he liked. This is the first thing. And the second thing is because I was understanding his business way uh, of life, let's say, and business part of uh, how the business is influencing, influencing him and what will be without the business part. And he really, uh, he told me that not everybody understood in that rough way, raw way of things. And he likes it because usually are trying to, because of his status, I'm trying to be a um, little bit more softer and polite and little bit more understanding of their behavior and i'm trying not to be i'm trying to mirror indeed and to be raw as possible what was it that made him decide to even talk to you in the first place um actually it was a coinc coincidence because some of their staff googled me on the linkedin and they found me on the linkedin and then first interview was with him and he really liked that I wasn't selling him anything. I ah. was actually talking to him like he's the client, not his boss. And I was very affirm what I can offer and what I cannot. And he really liked this uh, practical and simple way of doing things. This is the first thing. Then the second thing was uh, he was really amazed about my understanding exactly uh of um uh his um organization of the lives and uh, his uh, priorities and then after i had the first interview with him um i was very direct with him and i said look you this is the questions what you're asking me is wrong you should ask these questions if you want the answers but again i don't know do you want the answer or you want to um listen what you're expecting me to say and and he was very uh honored about my directness and yeah. angry at the same time and he was actually uh, shutting me off because we talked over the phone and he was I, I cannot talk with you now i'm very angry bye and i was actually feeling that i lost the client because of it but uh one week later he called me and he said nobody talked to me like this, I want to hire you. So he finally decided to take a step back and think about it. And probably uh, there might be a little bit of, he was really looking for what you offered all along. He just wasn't ready to admit it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's why you need to be very transparent about what you can offer. And you can, you must be very direct. And it's very difficult because even I have a, this uh, fight in me because I'm aware of his reach and mm -hmm. influence. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your book. You're you're writing a book. It's about to be published. Um, yes. The tell me all about that and, and what is it going to be about and what do you want people to take away from it? Actually, the book, uh, everybody around me, my friends and the family, and when I was talking with people, they said you should write a book with your um, experiences in life. It's very interesting. And I was not so sure that I'm able to write a book that I will be good at it. And uh, I wrote, I think now, 
it took me three years to write it, mm. uh, almost three years. And for me, it was very re- um, some sort of retrospective of my life. However, I as well input how should be done and not how I did it. So they have um, like a cheat sheet regarding some situations in my life. Uh, the book is called The Book That Changed Me. And actually, it should be like personal development um, guidance uh, with not my experience and thoughts, but um, my awareness that there is something that that is bigger than me, and this is the sharing the knowledge. And with sharing my experience, with my professional combining, with my professional knowledge, I was able to combine the both, you know, like the biography from one side, and then some solutions and some behavior from the professional side. And after the three years, I went to some publishers and I was rejected. And to be totally transparent, I was feeling really hurt and vulnerable because of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then after a while, um, um, I talked with uh, my supervision and uh, the institution when I finished my uh, education. And they said, come on, it can be too bad. Send me to read it. And I sent to them, and after two weeks, uh, three of them say, look, this is perfect. This is so original. We really liked it. We would like to publish it. And I said, okay, let's go with that. (laughs) And what I really liked about it, the way how they review it, they send it to the sixth um, 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 authors of some similar topics, And then uh, they got the feedback and they said, if the four of them said this is a good one, we will publish. And if not, then you need to change something. And actually, I I put it in my book as well, the all six reviews. Four of them was uh, very, um, let's say, uh, I I really cherish the words they put it. uh, And it was very beneficial for me. And two of them was neutral uh, because it was my first book, and they uh, told me that maybe I should first start with ebook or something less uh, than a fully uh, book. But again, I, I said, "Look, I have this in front of me. Let's yeah. do." It. Yeah. So basically, it will be published first week of February, something like that. It will be on Amazon. Uh, uh, it will be. Mostly, uh, there there will be audio and the digital copy as well. Oh, good. And I, sorry, I say good. It'll be audio as well. I'm looking forward yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and actually, uh, what I'm trying now to feel, um, what will be the 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 reaction from the public? So I'm eager to have the second edition, which will be incorporated with the feedback, because I think the book should be something live. And should be a little bit not just um, um, done it by author, but as well influenced by others who read it. It's, so this is my way of thinking. It's interesting. It's an interesting title, the book that changed me. What did you learn? Yeah. What did you learn and discover about yourself while writing it? I discovered that I was um, very lucky to go through some experiences which are very hard, like uh, changing my relationship with my parents, like changing and uh, gaining awareness of myself, Um, like understanding for me what is love, what is emotion, uh, in which way I like or want to love, in which way I want to be loved. This is totally different. Um, I as well understand in which way I can influence people, but not because of my ego, but because I I want to share myself and not to be the guy who helped, but to share myself. This is totally different. Um, And as well, it, it somehow structured my experiences so I can now pull it and use it as resources for my sessions and with my clients. Well, uh, it's a testimony to self-examination and introspection by any standard since 
you you wrote the book and obviously you had to give a lot of thought to it so that's pr that's pretty good yes yes i hope everybody will like it because there is a practical examples of mm -hmm. everyday life and everyday situations we all have uh, especially in conflict wise especially in uh, what questions to ask myself especially how to support myself so there is the tricky questions of understanding and not judging and as well uh, it's a practical way of understanding not to have like perfect model you should be like this and you should be um gaining your parts toward that no you should be as you want and you should have your own path because i i wanted to gain awareness that actually in your life you are not going on your path you're actually building your path and that you have this ability to build your path what do you see as far as trends in the future for wealth therapy and personal development um i see uh many help from the technology part especially artificial intelligence because you can automate it some um questions and you can uh automate it in way that you immediately have some correspondings regarding usually the that kind of people are wanting the solution now so mm -hmm. after the sessions or between the sessions they like to call you or to send you a text message of something and then artificial intelligence helped me to prioritize their needs because i cannot be available all the time this is the first thing the second thing is actually many of them are now understanding that their role model of their children and they're asking questions about how can it cause the section how can the the success perceived and transfer to the children not the same way they deal with it so they are now more aware and focused about the parenting they are now more way uh and focused about how to perceive their own emotions and what i really like is they are now more focused about the um some kind of spiritual development or i call it spiritual intelligence Mm -hmm. which means there is something greater than them which is very uh, crucial for them and it's important for them to recognize that and i for all of us to recognize that that spiritual yes. intelligence and spiritual growth is definitely a part of our lives yes. so so very quickly tell me a little bit more about this idea of artificial intelligence and how it's helping you uh currently uh i'm recording all the sessions and I'm creating like summary of the every session ah. with the bullet points. And it helped them because he can relate to them as the notes. And then if he don't remember something or he can, he can recall, I don't know, some se sessions before, let's say three months ago. So it's faster to them to gain that. The second thing is uh, I'm now starting to develop a little bit of behavior analysis which means when you have a session, I'm focusing more how it's nonverbal communication he is doing or she is doing, and then uh, focusing to, to show them through the video and to argument them with the notes what uh, is influencing that and how it's perceiving their way of doing things or their nonverbal communication. Because most of them are not aware of nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. Usually they are only aware of the verbal one. And AI is helping you create the notes and creating yes, that framework. Actually doing automatically and I, I'm a human and I cannot perceive everything. But uh, AI can <laughs> perceive like 60 points, 64 points in a um, second, which yes. means which means it, it, it's it, it's I don't know, triple me. <laughs> yeah. It allows you to spread yourself around a little more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, exactly. well, Jurich, I want to thank you for taking the time with us. If people want to reach out to you and, um, and, and talk with you, maybe learn more about you as a coach or a therapist and, and so on, how they, do they do that? They can find me on LinkedIn. This is the best and the fastest way to find me on LinkedIn. Um, I have other social networks, but I'm not so frequent mm -hmm. on them. 
So what is so your LinkedIn the, name? How do they find you on LinkedIn? Uh, Juraj Serrano, H. It calls. Uh, basically, they can just type well therapist. I am, there is only a couple of guys with that title, so they can find me very easily. Can you spell that for me? Wealth therapist. Oh, wealth therapist. Okay. I was thinking yeah. of Juraj Karavanich. Uh, Juraj is D-J-U-R-A-D-J-C-A-R-A-N-O-V-I-C. Okay. Well, I hope people will reach out. And I really appreciate all of your time and the, the insights that you've given us. So thank you very much for being here. And also to you listening, wherever you are, thanks for listening as well. I think that Jurich has thank given us a lot to think well, about. And I'm very honored to be part of this. Well, if any of you would like to reach out, please do so to Jurich. And if you'd like to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at Michael H I M I C H A E L H I at accessibe, A C C E S S I B E dot com, or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. Michael Hingson is M I C H A E L H I N G S O N. Love to hear from you and Jurich for you and for you listening. If any of you know of anyone else who you think ought to be a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, I would really appreciate you letting us know. And uh, we will we will get them on. So that would be great. And wherever you're listening, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate that a great deal. Thank you very much for, I'll for be, doing I'll it. I will add something for your audience as well. Uh-huh. Uh, whoever contact me from your audience and say that he learned from it from the podcast, I, he will have first session free. There you go. So if you'd like a session, just say you heard about Jurich from Unstoppable Mindset. Um, super. I appreciate you doing that. And I hope people will reach out. Well, yeah. Jurich, thank you once more for being here and for taking all the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. You're welcome.